All right, today we're going to um, cover chapter four, food purchasing and receiving control. Okay, so we're gonna apply the control process to purchasing and receiving. So we'll start by establishing our standards and standard procedures. And then we'll train our employees upon those standards and procedures. We'll monitor the personnel who perform the purchasing and receiving functions. Um, and this is probably one area where um, we'll rely a lot on reports and paperwork in order to monitor. And we're going to take corrective action whenever necessary. So responsibility for purchasing in a restaurant, um, it depends very much on the size of the restaurant. It could be the owner, could be a manager, could be the chef in some small restaurants, that could all be the same person. Um, in larger restaurants or um, food service operations like a hotel, you might have a department of purchasing that is responsible. There should only be one person or department responsible so that they can be held accountable for the purchases that are made. So some definitions, we have perishables. These items are typically fresh foods that have a relatively short shelf life. Things like milk, lettuce, fresh fish. Non-perishables. These are um, more like grocery items that have a relatively longer shelf life. Um, we keep them in the, um, often in dry storage, could be canned goods, um, our flour, sugar, spices, and any type of frozen food. And it may be the case that we get fresh shrimp in and that would be considered a perishable, but we can also get frozen shrimp in, and that would be a non-perishable. When we develop our standards and standard procedures for purchasing, <clears throat> we're gonna take into consideration the quality of the food purchased. So the USDA grades milk and um, meat and has different quality grades on those. Um, we're gonna look at how fresh we want things to be. We're gonna to have to figure out how much food to purchase. Um, things that to consider are, is there a discount if you buy more? Um, is there a limit to our storage space? Do we have big enough coolers, freezers, dry storage to um, hold our inventory? And how often do we want to get delivery or can we get delivery? Finally, the prices at which the food is purchased. Um, you want the best quality at the best price, um, but you might see specials, um, buy one, get one, promotional prices, introductory prices on a new item. Um, so all of that comes into play. We also have standard purchase specifications. These force owners or managers should um, determine your exact requirements in advance. It can be very helpful in menu preparation, um, forces the chefs to um, look at exactly what type of product they um, want to get in. Standard specs also eliminate misunderstanding between purchasers and purveyors. If you work in a large enough um, operation, um, you'll put these standard specifications out for bid to find um, the lowest price on them. It also eliminates the need for detailed verbal descriptions. So you don't have to um, sit on the phone with somebody and talk about what you need. They also help you check food in as it's received. So example, um, 
Chef says, I need mushrooms for my special tomorrow, tells you as a purchaser. So what are you going to order? What, is, what does that mean to order mushrooms? Do you want fresh mushrooms or dried mushrooms? Um, any one of the mushrooms we have listed here? A lot of people might just say, okay, I'll get you button mushrooms because that's common and I shouldn't have any problem getting that. Is if the chef gives a standard purchase spec, gives us the grade, the US number one size, um, the color description of the mushroom, and then the size of the packing. And that's a very specific um, thing. And you're probably gonna get something that looks like this photograph. Another definition that we have is par stock. In this chapter, it's going to mean the maximum quantity that should be on hand at any given time. Um, but this book has other definitions for it. Uh, we're going to do some calculations. Um, after I do the PowerPoint, I'm going to do another video on um, the Excel files, and we'll be talking about PAR stock. Another form we have is a purchaser's market quotation list. It's used for a taking daily inventory of perishable items, determining suitable order quantities. Let me go back. <clears throat> and record the prices and um, select vendors. So <clears throat> on this, this is a simplified form. I have my um, items that I'm taking inventory of, milk, eggs, sour cream, heavy cream, butter, and tomato sauce. And I have my pre-printed on the form what my PAR stock is. So 12 gallons of milk all the way down to 18 cans of tomato sauce. Then the next column is handwritten um, of taking inventory of each item. So we've got four gallons of milk, four dozen eggs, all the way down to 12 cans of tomato sauce. So I'm just gonna calculate the order amount by subtracting what I have on hand from our PAR stock. So we'll order eight gallons of milk all the way down to six gallons of tomato sauce. Okay, so these next two slides, I'm gonna go into more detail on the Excel spreadsheets, but we've got a periodic order method and we use that when we wanna place our order, let's say it could be every Monday we place an order for seafood or every month we place an alcohol order um, or some other specified period. So when we do that, we have to know how much we're going to need for the upcoming period, whether it's a week or two weeks or a month. We're going to subtract the amount that we have on hand in inventory. And then we want an amount at the end of the period that will last until the next delivery. And we'll, this will make a lot more sense when we look at the um, Excel file. Perpetual inventory method is we order whenever an individual item reaches a predetermined reorder point. <clears throat> so we will know what our PAR stock is for this item. Um, I'll show you in the Excel file how to calculate the reorder point. We'll subtract that from the PAR stock and get a subtotal. We'll add back a normal usage until delivery, and that will give us our reorder quantity. <clears throat> so what determines our PAR stock, or the maximum quantity of perishables on hand, versus our storage space? Um, you don't want to order more product that can fit in your cooler or freezer or your dry storage. Um, also, the amount of money that can be invested in inventory. Um, there can be limits on that. Um, <clears throat> your desired frequency of ordering 
you have to remember that if you're ordering something every day, that takes time and it costs extra money every time you have a delivery come in, every time you have to sit down and calculate that you're gonna make an order. How the, for particular ingredients, we'll have to order more of the fast moving items and fewer of the slow moving items. And then we also have to consider the purveyor's minimum order requirements. Um, will they do something like split cases? An example would be vodka comes 12 bottles to a case, but we don't really need 12 bottles of vodka. Um, but we might find a purveyor who will give us four bottles of vodka and four bottles of gin and four bottles of whiskey in that case of 12. And that might be something that works better for us. Um, they also might have a minimum dollar amount that you have to order. Um, and some companies have like a minimum number of line items that you have to order. So you might have to order $300 worth of mushrooms just to get the delivery truck to come to your place or like 11 different line items. Okay, there's a lot of places we can get um, food from. It's not really that important on this. Um, what is more important is the fact um, of centralized purchasing. It's often used by chains and franchises. So think of chain restaurants like uh, McDonald's and Burger King and Wendy's and Popeye's and all of those. But it could also be a group of independent operators that work together and get purchases for all their perks, participating units being made by one central office. So centralized purchasing, some advantages it can have. It's possible that food and beverages can be purchased at lower prices because you're going to have a higher volume. And if you think of McDonald's, um, every McDonald's has the same menu, at least in, in this region. Um, and so McDonald's has a lot better buying power and can get things at lower prices. The desired quality can be attained more readily because the purchaser has a greater choice of markets. Um, McDonald's definitely has contracts with every type of purveyor um, so that they would never run out of their product. Foods can be obtained that meet the specs. So the, um, you know, all their French fries are gonna be the same in every McDonald's that you go to and every quarter pounder is going to be the same. Those regional distribution areas or commissaries, they can hold a larger inventory making sure there's always a reliable supply to the individual units. So um, let's see, there's a McDonald's over on the other side of the hospital. Um, they shouldn't ever worry about not being able to get their product when they order it. The possibility of dishonest purchasing in individual units is greatly reduced. Um, some examples that um, things that a dishonest purchaser might do. Um, and it's a lot easier in a standalone restaurant. Um, whoever's doing the purchasing might pick a particular vendor because they're gonna give him tickets to a Saints game. Or maybe his brother-in-law sells some type of food product. He's gonna order from that company uh, knowing that it's going to help out his brother-in-law, but at the same time, the restaurant's paying more money than they really have to for that product. Disadvantages to centralized purchasing. <coughs> Each unit must accept the standard item in stock and has little freedom to purchase for its own particular needs. Um, so yeah, McDonald's has to buy the McDonald's French fry from their supplier. Um, they can't take advantage of local specials 
if um, somebody's selling ground beef, um, McDonald's, like the Thibodeau McDonald's can't go buy ground beef for 10 cents a pound um, if it was available here in Thibodeau. Um, and then menus are ordinarily standardized. So there's a, that limits individual unit managers freedom to create things on their menu. Um, so a shrimp po' boy, like if you, if you owned a shrimper, shrimping boat um, and caught your own shrimp and wanted to make a po' boy at your McDonald's, you would not be able to do that. Okay, methods of obtaining price quotes. All of these on the slide are really old fashioned ways. Um, most people will get their price quotes by going on the internet and going to the purveyor's website. So when it comes to receiving, you have to have standards in pl place. Um, the important part here is that you want your own internal document. We're going to call it a purchaser's market quotation list and make sure that the quantity that is delivered matches what we ordered. We also want to make sure that the quality delivered is what we ordered. And finally, the prices on the invoice should match those that are on our market quotation list. Um, again, with quantity, you're also looking at the individual items and making sure, like if you ordered 10 pounds of celery, um, make sure they didn't deliver 10 cases of celery. Or instead of 10 pounds of celery, they delivered 10 pounds of coriander. Um, so all of those are things that you need to look at. This is a sample invoice. You will see the quantity that is ordered. 20 pounds we have, this is our meat order of beef tenderloin and 20 pounds of leg of lamb. These are the prices that were being charged per pound. Um, and then that's just each pound price is multiplied by 20 to get a dollar amount. So we end up owing $432 for this delivery. <clears throat> Controlling our ingredients while they're in inventory. So this is, um, this is assuming we're large enough to have a storage area that is separate from the kitchens. Um, you wanna make sure you don't overload your storage capacity. Uh, you don't wanna have jammed packed coolers or freezers or dry storage areas. Um, when you have that, it's a lot easier for your employees to steal from you and for perishables to spoil um, because people can't find them fast enough. So an item shelf life is the amount of time that food retains its maximum freshness, flavor, and quality while it's in storage. And clearly, you know, it varies from one product to another. Um, things like fresh fish might last only a couple of days. Um, gallons of milk might last up to a week or so, depending on their expiration date that you get. And then the more frequent you have deliveries, the more the higher your costs are going to be that you're going to have to pay. So I've got a comparison here of a organized storage area. This is a dry storage area and there's like items placed together so you don't have to go searching around to find a particular item. It's nice and bright. The floor is very clean as opposed to this very poor storage area um, where you can't be sure you would be getting any type of FIFO rotation in here at all. Um, and of course the sanitation is just terrible. So how much we have in inventory is determined by at least seven factors. The first is our storage capacity. How big are the coolers, 
freezers, the dry storage areas, um, the perishability of the items. Um, we can buy a ton of lettuce, but we won't be able to use it before it spoils. So it's not going to be worth it to buy that much. The vendor delivery schedule, um, especially if you're not living in a big city, you're gonna have limited days of delivery. Things like produce and seafood are only going to come on one certain day or two certain days a week to your area. Um, you might have potential savings from increased purchase size. Um, could be that our alcohol supplier would give us a free case if we buy five cases of vodka. Um, our operating calendar, and that varies from place to place. Some places are open 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Um, some are only open Monday through Friday. Um, if we had something like our own business, our owner's birthday is on July 2nd, which of course would be the week of the 4th of July. Um, but we close for the owner's birthday party because that's what the owner insists on doing. Um, and that might be the only day the purveyor delivers that week. So we'd have to come up with a plan in order to have ingredients for the next day we were open. Another thing that's um, important is stock outages. How critical is it if you run out of menu items? Um, so when I worked at Beau Rivage, the uh, casino resort in Biloxi, um, an example of this would be at our buffet, we always had bread pudding and coconut macaroons, and there was never any excuse for us to run out of that product. So we always had to keep ahead of production because we could serve, we always served at least 2,000 people a day and up to 5,000 people a day at the buffet. Um, so that was really important. Um, also the value of inventory dollars to the operator. Um, what dollar amount are the owners willing to invest in inventory? Um, an example of this might be creating a wine list. Um, how many reds and how many whites are we going to have? And then how many bottles of each are we going to be able to store and afford to keep in the restaurant? Um, places like Restaurant Revolution in New Orleans has a very extensive um, wine list. Um, it's, their inventory is easily over a million dollars uh, at any given time. Uh, whereas a local small restaurant, it might be thousands of dollars at the most. So standard procedure for receiving. You're gonna check quantity, quality, and price for each item. Make sure you're using your order document, not just the invoice. Um, you're going to forward the paperwork to the proper personnel. Somebody does bookkeeping or accounting, somebody pays the bills, they've got to get that paperwork. Um, moving the food to appropriate storage areas, so getting the food into the cooler and freezer, very important. So now we've got two more definitions, um, and it kind of ties into um, perishable and non-perishable. We have foods that are extremely perishable by nature um, and oftentimes would be purchased daily. So things like fresh bread, um, leaf lettuce, things that um, might have a shelf life of one or two days. Um, one example from Beau Rivage, the pastry ship shop, we had um, we had a hundred dozen Krispy Kreme donuts delivered every morning and 50 dozen went up to the buffet and then 50 dozen went to the employee dining room. So that was called a direct and it went directly on to that particular day's food cost. 
And the opposite of this is that um, a storeroom item or a store. These are groceries that are perishable but have a relatively longer shelf life. Um, they wouldn't be for immediate use. And they don't show up on your daily food cost until they are issued from the storeroom to the kitchen. So some of these are non-perishables, but you could have like even gallons of milk. They have a longer shelf life than um, loaves of fresh bread. So again, directs are the perishables, daily food cost, the stores um, are when they get issued to you. Okay, training for receiving. It's very important that your receivers um, are qualified. There's a lot of things they have to know. Biggest thing is food quality, they have to make sure that um, they can identify fresh meat, seafood, poultry, as well as no one um, fresh herb from another fresh herb and be able to tell if the quality is acceptable um, for every single ingredient that's delivered. Mm. Some restaurants cut corners and don't require quality checks on delivery. Maybe that their chef checks it later, but somebody's got to check the quality of these items. Otherwise, you're going to send out some um, poor product to your diners and they won't come back. Okay, so that's going to be um, that's going to be it for this. I'll do a separate video for the um, Excel sheets.